Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to the African Epistemologies Seminar Series hosted by the Institute of, of Humanities in Africa, also known as HUMA, based in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. My name is Samen Lovo. I'm a doctoral fellow at HUMA. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thank you to our speaker, Dr. Michael Omonge. Dr. Michael Omonge is an assistant professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. Uh, before then, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto and an Andrew Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, he obtained his PhD from the University of KwaZulu Natal. He works on a variety of topics in both analytic and African traditions of philosophy, including but not limited to uh, perceptions, imagination, and social epistemology, philosophy of education, and philosophical methods. Uh, Dr. Omonge, thank you so much for making the time, and we are very sorry for waking you in the early hours of the morning. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so Dr. Omonge's talk is uh, centered around the epistemic ignorance and the geography of philosophical traditions. I'm going to hand over the floor to Dr. Omonge, and then we're going to open the floor for questions and discussion. Dr. Omonge, over to you. Thank you so much, Sane, and thank you everyone for coming today and making the time. Um, um, I'm glad, and uh, I hope you are going to have an enriching time today. So let me just share my screen so that we can start. Okay. Um, how many minutes do I have, Sunny, for, for the talk? And how many minutes for the question? I'll give you 30 for the talk, and we're going to use the other half for questions. Great. Um, so I'm going to um, more or less breeze through the talk. I will. I will try not to skip the important bits um, and some of the most complex aspects I would, I would skip so I can squeeze in between the time. Um, so yeah, without much ado, let's, let's begin. So my talk is, is, is motivated by my educational and work experiences in South Africa and in Anglo-America, which I would often just call the West in the stock. Um, and why is my, my background important? Why, why, why? Why should there be any philosophical significance about, about my, my education and work background? Um, so let me give you a bit of, a bit of background. So, there are different philosophical traditions. There are, uh, there are Chinese philosophy, there is Indian philosophy, there is of course African philosophy, and there is Western philosophy. So these are different philosophical tradition. They, they, they deal with different questions. They have different approaches to answering these questions and they have different methodologies as well. Um, my concern today is, is, is with um, African and Western uh, philosophy, philosophical traditions. And that is because I am an African and I'm specializing in analytic philosophy. So that puts me in, in, in both worlds. And, and um, I have noticed over, over the course of my uh, attending conferences and, um, and uh, interacting with fellow African and Western philosophers, I, I, I have noticed some practices <clears throat> which, though might seem benign, I, 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 I want to try to convince you today that they are not, that they are rather epistemically vicious. Um, uh, so I, I, I let me give you a bit of yeah, conceptual clarification. I've already discussed African philosophy. I've also briefly discussed analytic philosophy. Um, these are two different philosophical traditions. They deal with different questions. They have different approaches to answering these questions. Um, and I will also be talking at large about um, epistemic injustice 
uh, epistemic injustice by way of definition is any wrong directed towards an agent in their capacity as a knower. So something can be morally wrong, but not epistemically wrong. And something can be epistemically wrong and not morally wrong. And something can be both epistemically and morally wrong. But my concern today is not morality, but epistemic uh, um, um, wrongness. Yeah. So that is what I, I, I will be focusing on today. Um, so an example of an epistemic injustice, an epistemic wrong is, is, is when um, um, a white person um, um, prejudges someone who is not white that they can have a certain knowledge. This is often called white ignorance and, and, and uh, it is a form of epistemic injustice. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about white ignorance today, but that is an example uh, of an epistemic injustice. So my argument today is simple. <clears throat> So uh, this is the structure of, of my argument. The premise, the first premise is that any attitude that wrongs a person as a knower due to a prejudice is a form of epistemic injustice. Um, premise two, in both African and Western communities, a prejudice that analytic philosophy is the ideal philosophy is latent and operational. And this leads the, to the to the, to the third premise, uh, which is that this prejudice, this prejudice that analytic philosophy is the ideal philosophy, uh, is often expressed in wonder and surprise by some African and Western philosophy, uh, philosophers leading to praising and doubting the African analytic philosopher's schemes. Um, and then this leads to premise four, that these wonder premise and doubt are attitudes that wrong the African analytic philosopher as a knower. And the conclusion is that these attitudes of wonder, surprise, praise, and doubt are forms of epistemic injustice. So um, um, this argumentative structure exemplifies what analytic philosophy is. Um, so if my definition earlier is not clear, this is how analytic philosophy is done and what analytic philosophy is. So the plan today, the plan is to is to is to make a case is to make a case for for premise two is to make a case for this for this prejudice and that is what I want to do uh, from there I would then show uh, I would show how excuse me let me just admit those waiting. Yeah. It's okay, Dr. Mungo, you don't have to admit them. You can continue with the talk. Uh, Someone else is, is doing that. Thank you. Yeah, they've, <laughs> they've been waiting for quite a while. That was why I decided to do that. Anyway. Don't worry, I'll sort it out. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm going to make a case for, for premise two, which is in both African and Western community, a prejudice that analytic philosophy is that this philosophy is latent and operational. Um, I will make a case for that. Um, and then I will show how this prejudice that is latent in the Western and African community leads to wonder, surprise, praise, and doubt in both communities. Um, and then I will show how the wonder, surprise, praise, and doubt are forms of epistemic injustice. Um, I will skip this part. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not um, as important as the, uh, as the other one, and also because I am short of time. So let's begin. Um, so what prejudice is latent and operational in the African and Western philosophical communities? Um, whether due to colonial um, uh, uh, influence, uh, probably due to colonial influence, I should say, um, there is this um, um, hegemony that analytic philosophy or Western philosophy is the ideal philosophy. Uh, maybe it is not colonial, maybe it is just um, a historical accident, but, but th there, is, there is that um, um, implicit um, um, bias towards analytic philosophy. It is taken to be the ideal philosophy as against African, Indian, Chinese, 
you know, if you're not doing analytic philosophy or, in fact, take African philosophers, for example. Uh, most of us are trained in the analytic tradition. Um, some, 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 some years back, um, some African philosophers did an empirical study to, to, um, to find out how African philosophers are trained. And they discovered that uh, almost all the universities in Africa, at least those that, those that responded to their survey, uh, uh, teach largely Western philosophy. Um, so you can see how there is that analytic hegemony, uh, um, um, which is the prejudicial belief that analytic philosophy is the ideal philosophy. Uh, and then this, this analytic hegemony leads to an identity power. Uh, and what I mean by that is that because analytic philosophy is taken to be the ideal philosophy, now there is this collective social imagination that the analytic philosopher is the ideal philosopher. Put these two together, put analytic, put analytic hegemony and the identity part together, and you have what I call analytic prejudice in philosophical practice. And by analytic prejudice, I just mean the prejudice that analytic philosophy is that the philosophy, and also that the analytic philosopher is the ideal philosopher. But this analytic prejudice, even though it is latent, no one goes about talking about it. Um, um, it, is, it, is, it is manifestly resisted in both communities. You know, Westerners are now, are now aware that um, this, this, this bias towards analytic philosophy is operational. Um, uh, it, 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 it decides how um, recruitment works. It decides how journal publication works. They are now writing about it and making it aware. So there is that resistance in both communities towards analytic prejudice. Uh, but regardless, regardless of this resistance, um, this prejudice, this analytic prejudice and philosophical practice is still operational. It, you know, it's still, it, it is still an implicit bias in both African and Western communities. So as an implicit bias, now we have moved to the second, to the second uh, plan. You know, I have made a case for this, I'm moving to this now. Uh, so as an implicit bias, analytic prejudice leads to premise three. And um, to remind ourselves, premise three is that this analytic prejudice is expressed in wonder and surprise by some African and Western philosophers which then leads to overtly praising and covertly doubting the African analytic philosopher's skills or dexterity, I call it. So um, um, to, be, to, be, to be more explicit, I have broken premise three into two. Um, um, one part dedicated to um, the African community and then the other part dedicated to the Western community. Uh, so as you can see, some, some African philosophers sometimes, and I could stress, that what I'm saying today, or my claim today is, is, is uh, my claims are not general claims in the sense that since they are built on my personal experience, I have tried to, 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 to preface them with some and sometimes to show that they are highly limited, but nonetheless warrant discussion and, 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 and warrant awareness. So uh, premise 3.1 is that some African philosophers sometimes wonder why African philosophers, why Sorry, why analytic philosophy? I should say, why analytic philosophy? And so they overtly praise the African analytic philosopher skills. Uh, and then the second part of premise three, which is dedicated to the Western community, is that sometimes some Western analytic philosophers are surprised to see African, um, an African analytic philosopher. And so they overtly praise or covertly doubt uh, these analytic philosophers skill. Uh, so my plan today is to show that this wonder, overt praise, surprise, overt praise again, and then discover doubt are all forms of epistemic injustice. That these attitudes are not benign. They are, they are epistemically wrong. And um, we ought to be aware of it as philosophers and non-philosophers, perhaps this generalizes beyond philosophy, uh, which I hope it does. And because there are non-philosophers here today. Um, um, yeah. 
Um, I'm going to skip this part. Um, yeah. So, okay, I should just skip it. I should go back. Uh, so this attitude of wonder, surprise, and praise, and doubt, the, 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 the sort of exhibit is substantive ignorance about philosophy education in Africa. No doubt, I have said earlier that philosophical education in Africa is largely Western in that Western philosophy is still taught across most uh, African universities. But that is not to say that those trained within the African continent um, do not have the required skill to do analytic philosophy. And in fact, why should analytic philosophy be taught to be superior than African philosophy? And that is what I mean by substantive ignorance. So uh, um, um, it is not a neglect. It is not something that they are, uh, that, 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 is, that, is, that is hidden. It is known. The, 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 the ignorance is active, not passive, I should put it. Um, and which is where uh, the, the label geophilosophical ignorance comes from. So like, uh, like white ignorance that I discussed earlier, um, geophilosophical ignorance is a kind of epistemic ignorance. Um, it, is a, it, it, is, it, is, it is an active neglect not to pursue an available resource for knowledge acquisition. No. So like any form of um, epistemic ignorance, geophilosophical ignorance will lead to epistemic injustice. But again, I have to make that case, which is what I'm going to do today. No. So I'm going to skip this. Um, so this is the general framework of how geophilosophical ignorance leads to epistemic injustice. Geophilosophical ignorance um, uh, elicits some prejudicial attitudes, which are wonder, praise, surprise, and doubt. And all of this leads to epistemic injustice, but they lead to different forms of epistemic injustice. Wonder leads to epistemic withdrawal, praise leads to epistemic meekness, surprise leads to epistemic gatekeeping, praise and doubt in the, in the, in the, in the Western community leads to epistemic chauvinism. So uh, my goal today, my primary goal, is to convince you that all of this, or to show that all of this, epistemic withdrawal, meekness, gatekeeping, and chauvinism are all forms of epistemic injustice. So epistemic withdrawal. How is epistemic withdrawal a form of epistemic injustice? Again, epistemic withdrawal um, 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 is sourced by the wonder that some African philosophers you know, express when they, when they, when they hear that uh, an African specializes in African philosophy, they wonder why analytic philosophy? They wonder why analytic philosophy? Uh, and you would recall that I said earlier that the analytic prejudice in philosophy is actively resisted. So when, they, so when some African philosopher wonder like this, what they are saying in effect is that they are, they are, uh, they, the, the, their resistance to the analytic prejudice is acting as a positive implicit bias. What I mean by positive is that it is causing an action. It is, it is, uh, uh, it is causing them to, 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 to sort of withdraw from entering into a knowledge situation involving analytic philosophy. So, and that's what I mean by epistemic withdrawal. So, uh, um, so when some African philosophers wonder why, when they ask, why are you doing philosophy? What they are saying is a form of resistance to analytic prejudice in philosophy is that African philosophers shouldn't specialize in analytic philosophy. So their grievance is that the African analytic philosophy betrays this expectation by not epistemically withdrawing from entering into another situation involving analytic philosophy. But again, clearly, this is a wrong done to the African analytic philosopher, because why should the African analytic philosopher standing in his own epistemic community be conformist? Philosophy, more than any discipline, should prize itself um, 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 in rewarding those who are not conformist, you know, um, 
philosophers are, are, are claimed to be critical thinker. And one of the hallmark of a critical thinker is the ability to not be conformist, to think outside of the bus. So why should the African analytic philosopher be blamed for not being conformist? And that is how epistemic withdrawal is a form of epistemic injustice. It wrongs the African analytic philosopher in its capacity as a knower by wanting him or her to be conformist. Uh, epistemic meekness. Again, some African philosophers um, do not wonder, but they praise the African analytic philosopher for having the philosophical skill to do analytic philosophy. But when they do this, what they are, what they are saying in effect is that analytic philosophy, again, recall the analytic prejudice that I discussed earlier, that analytic philosophy being the idea requires superior philosophical skills. That is what they are saying in effect. So uh, in, in this way, the, 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 their resistance to the analytic prejudice in philosophy is acting as a negative implicit bias. What I mean by negative is that it is blocking an action. Um, 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 it, is, it, is, it, is, it is blocking them. It is blocking uh, the African philosophical community from, from from not actively um, 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 weighing the, the, the resources available to them. So when they praise the African analytic philosopher skill, uh, that praise can lead to credibility excess in the sense that it could give the African analytic philosopher an inflated sense of their skills, you know. He, he or she now walks around pompously thinking that he's better off than uh, the next, uh, uh, the fellow African philosopher. And this will lead to uh, arrogance and neglect, which are epistemic biases. Um, they would double check their, their, their findings. They wouldn't do the necessary research they need to do because they think they are better off now. And all of this is due to the credibility, credibility excess accorded to them unjustly by their own community. And that is a form of epistemic injustice um, because once epistemic community should keep out epistemic biases, it is the job of once epistemic community to ensure that its members um, acquire knowledge in the right way. But if the epistemic community now, now fails in this regard by giving its member too much credibility, leading to the cultivation of epistemic biases, then the epistemic community has failed in its job and it has wronged the analytic African philosopher. That is how epistemic meekness is also a form of epistemic injustice. Now let's move to the Western community. Um, so sometimes some Western analytic philosophers are surprised to see an African analytic philosophy. Well, we, 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 we can interpret the surprise statistically in the sense that, well, it is just statistically uncommon to see an African analytic philosopher. Analytic philosophy, by virtue of it being Western philosophy, is typically done by Westerners, not Africans. So when they see an African analytic philosopher, um, surprise is not uh, an atypical reaction. So we can interpret the surprise statistically. Uh, but, but the fact that the Western analytic philosopher belongs to the analytic tradition, which again, you would remember, is a systemic power. It, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is the tradition that is taken to have an hegemonic power over other traditions in philosophy. The analytic prejudice I talked about earlier. So the fact that the Western analytic philosopher belongs to that tradition gives the surprise, even though we interpret it statistically, give the surprise a negative value. And by that, I mean that it gives it a negative connotation. So think of, think of negative value laid in this way. So suppose that the surprise is exhibited not by a white person, but by say 
uh, an Indian person who is also from a marginalized philosophical tradition like the African tradition, the surprise might be value-free or at best positively value-laden in the sense that the Indian analytic philosopher would be saying, oh, nice to see someone from another marginalized tradition specializing in an in analytic philosophy, which is different from when a white person is surprised to see an African analytic philosopher. Because now we, uh, the, 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 the surprise has a negative connotation. So the, 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 the Western analytic philosopher, when so surprised, is, is, is putting more burden on the African analytic philosopher to, to, to justify its own credibility. Because the, 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 the African analytic philosopher would not be more conscious of themselves, ultimately lowering their confidence in themselves. So even if we interpret the, the, the surprise statistically, what the Western analytic philosopher is doing, again, when they are surprised, not all of them are so surprised, and even those they are so surprised are not surprised all the time, but when that surprise is occasioned, what is happening is a form of epistemic gatekeeping in the sense that it is an attempt to treat a knowledge space as proprietary to one's epistemic community. And that in itself is epistemically unjust because it is a form of epistemic exploitation. Epistemic exploitation is, is, is when the burden of justification, the burden of proof is put on the oppressed to demonstrate that there had been an oppression. For example, um, a man, um, sexually harassed his co-worker by making lewd comments towards her. And when the lady voiced that she has been uh, se uh, sexually harassed, the man says, no, demonstrate to me how what I said is lewd. That is epistemic exploitation. The oppressed should not be, 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 be expected to demonstrate the oppression they had felt. And that is precisely what epistemic gatekeeping is doing because when so surprised, the Western analytic philosopher is putting the burden of credibility justification on the African analytic philosopher. It is saying, oh, nice to see that you are an analytic philosopher, but now demonstrate to us, convince me that you have the necessary skills to, 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 to do analytic philosophy. And that is what I mean by epistemic gatekeeping and how epistemic gatekeeping wrongs the analytic African philosopher. Um, epistemic chauvinism. So sometimes some Western philosophers overtly praise the African analytic philosopher. Uh, we, have, we have encountered praise in the African community earlier, uh, which led to epistemic meekness, and I've explained that. But again, this praise also uh, uh, occurs in the, in the, sometimes it occurs in the Western philosophical community. And when it so occurs, what, what, what this overt praise, what this laudation espouses is the prejudgment that the African analytic philosopher possesses the necessary superior philosophical skills, uh, philosophical skills to, 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 to do African philosophy. Again, this leads to credibility access because you shouldn't prejudge someone to possess superior skills when the, when the person had not even demonstrated that they know what they're talking about. So this leads to credibility access. And just like in the case of epistemic meekness, where it led to arrogance and neglect, it also leads to arrogance and neglect in this case. And again, the Western community, like the African community, wrongs the African analytic philosopher by failing to keep out epistemic vices, arrogance and neglect, and all other epistemic vices that the African analytic philosopher would have cultivated because he was given too much credibility. That's how epistemic chauvinism, the praise aspect of epistemic chauvinism, that is how uh, it leads to um, epistemic injustice. 
Now, I should clarify that um, we saw that the praise in the African community led to epistemic meekness, a, a, a sort of epistemic low self-esteem. It is, it is, it is sourced by, by, by that low self-esteem that Africans have implicitly imbibed because of the analytic prejudice and philosophy. But the praise in the Western uh, philosophical community is not sourced by any epistemic low self-esteem. Rather, it is sourced by an exaggerated one because the Western analytic philosopher is judging the African analytic philosopher to be credible only, only because the African philosopher specializes in analytic philosophy because they share the same tradition. There is no other reason. It is because the, um, the African person specializes in analytic philosophy and analytic philosophy is taken to be the ideal. So ipso facto, the African person uh, um, 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 must be credible must know what he's talking about, must have the necessary skills to do analytic philosophy. So epistemic chauvinism is an exaggerated and prejudiced support of one's epistemic community. And this leads nicely to the doubt aspect of epistemic chauvinism. So sometimes instead of praising the African analytic philosopher, some Western analytic philosophers overtly doubt the African analytic philosopher. Of course, they won't go about expressing this doubt, which is why it is covered, um, but they do. Um, and what's happening here uh, is that unlike, unlike, uh, un, unlike when the African analytic philosopher is praised, in this case, okay, it's unlike when he, uh, the African analytic philosopher is praised, um, such that his analyticity, I know philosophy has too much verbosity, <laughs> um, where uh, their analyticity is heightened. In this case, where a doubt is expressed, what is being heightened is their Africanity. You would record that I said earlier that the only reason the Western analytic philosopher praises the African analytic philosopher is because they share the same tradition. That is, the Western analytic philosopher is, 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 is putting their emphasis on the analyticity of the African philosopher. However, when doubt is expressed, covertly expressed, the emphasis is on the Africanity of the analytic philosopher. You, you can see the juxtaposition. When this happens, instead of leading to a credibility excess, as it did here, it leads to a credibility deficit in the sense that the African analytic philosopher is prejudged to not possess the relevant skills to do analytic philosophy and just solely because of their Africanity. This has been stressed to be epistemically unjust in the literature in the sense that it is a form of testimonial injustice. Testimonial injustice is when you don't, you, 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 uh, you don't believe what someone says because of their social standing. Take for example, um, a witness, um, a witness, Testimony is discredited by a judge because the witness is black, or, or the witness is white and the judge is black. You know, complicate the story as you want, but that is what is meant by testimonial injustice. And epistemic chauvinism, the doubt aspect, is a form of testimonial injustice, which is clearly epistemically unjust. So, um, we have seen how epistemic meekness, sorry, epistemic withdrawal, epistemic meekness in the African community leads to epistemic injustice 
We have also seen how epistemic gatekeeping and epistemic chauvinism in the Western community leads to epistemic injustice. Um, so as I said at the beginning of this talk, that even though the attitudes that, 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 that lead to this, to this different form of epistemic injustices um, disguised as you know, benign and innocent, they are not. And I hope that I've been able to, 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 to demonstrate how the, the, how they wrong the African analytic philosopher in their capacity as a knower, how they are all forms of epistemic injustice. Uh, the next slide is the contribution aspects that I said I would skip. Um, anyway, thank you so much for coming to my talk. And I hope the question section is going to be as invigorating as the talk itself has been. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Omonge, for that enriching talk. I see we have some philosophers in the room. We have African philosophers who are doing analytic philosophy. So that's going to be interesting. I'm going to open up the, uh, the, the floor for questions and comments. Uh, but before I open it for, uh, to everyone, oh. before I open it to everyone, it, like just like listening to your talk, I was thinking of um, Emmanuel Chukudiez's work on the ultra faithful and like how um, in philosophy, especially analytic philosophy, they always push this idea of uh, philosophy has to be universal. So that was very interesting. I'm just like wondering, do you think that analytic philosophy adds value in African philosophy? Um, <laughs> I think I, 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 I must say yes, because I myself am an African analytic philosophy. And um, I think there is, there is a confluence between the two traditions and they can learn from one another. I think African philosophy can learn from analytic philosophy and that analytic philosophy can learn from African philosophy. Um, so I, I, I have to say yes, because my my day-to-day my -day academic life um, demonstrates as such. Thank you. Okay, I see a hand, um, Sadia, you can go first and then Catherine, you can go after Sadia, thank you. Don't forget to unmute yourself. So we can hear you, Sadia, please unmute yourself. Okay, let me do that. Okay, I think I have to do that. Aha, great. Hi, thank Hi. you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm very, um, I'm very reticent to praise it right now <laughs> in light of this uh, presentation, but, but thank you for this. <laughs> and like, I, I very much appreciate the nuanced way in which you've articulated this kind of reflexive position. I'm not a philosopher, um, so I come to this from, you know, kind of a different perspective, but my question would be then, uh, Michael, how, given that, um, you know, philosophy is a robust, engagement, as you said, criticality is appreciated. How would you distinguish when somebody is giving either praise or critique? How would you then attribute that to either, depending on their location, so if it is a, um, a white analytic philosopher, 
how do you take the critique as a critique of the argument or as a critique of um, you know, doubting the, the capacity or being surprised by the capacity to do such a good argument? So I'm saying, how do you attribute it to the identity of the person? Because you know, philosophy by and large is about robust critique back and forth. So you know, at some point you're gonna have praise, at some point you're gonna have um, you know, kind of doubt around it. How can one attribute this not to the quality of the argument, but to the location of the person that is engaging you? Uh, and I, I appreciated what you said earlier, saying that you know, if you found um, you know, an Indian analytical philosopher or an Islamic analytical philosopher, for example, that came into this conversation, they would appreciate that you're both coming from a position of marginality. So then by virtue of their positioning, you're going to be taking their argument as not coming from a position of epistemic chauvinism. But what would allow somebody to have a genuine critique that was located as a Western philosopher coming from that tradition, but what, what would allow you to take their critique on board as being um, analytically rigorous rather than coming from any kind of prejudicial position? I'm not sure the question is clear. But, it, is, um, it, is, it is very clear. And, and thank you so much, Sadia. Um, so um, the distinction between between the two is 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 that um, the one that the the the, uh, the the one that is that is prejudicial uh, would be characterized by a sort of prejudgment. So you see uh, the, the 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 African analytic philosopher enter the room uh, enters the room and before they make their case, before they say whatever they want to say, uh, these attitudes are elicited. You know, uh, like I stressed at the beginning of the talk, when I talk to fellow African philosophers, and as soon as they hear that I do Afri uh, that I do analytic philosophy, they either just immediately ask me, but why? Or they say, oh, that's good. I haven't discussed anything with them. I haven't made any argument. Just that statement that I do analytic philosophy elicited those two um, those two attitudes from them. So the, the the focus of epistemic injustice in this case is that prejudgment, and the same thing applies in the Western community. I'll give you a clear example. I was at a conference in Germany, and of course, I I was the only black person in attendance, um, and um, as soon as um, it became known that I had my PhD in Africa and not in, in, in some Anglo-American university, the surprise that I, had, the, 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 that I had stressed in this talk became very evident on some of the Western analytic philosophers' faces. And um, so, the, the, the prejudicial bit is characterized by a prejudgment. So if, for example, after giving a talk, probably not this one, <laughs> probably after, after giving a talk, um, the, a Western analytic philosopher critically um, um, engages me on my talk and expresses skepticism about my, about my argument, that wouldn't be prejudicial. That would be squally. Um, uh, uh, expected and 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 correct philosophical uh, um, practice, but if if that covert doubt, again, the emphasis again is on the covert. In the case of the correct philosophical practice, the doubt is not covert. The doubt is overt. I have expressed the position. They are overtly, you know expressing their own doubt about what I have said. So again, there are, there are, there are prefaces that distinguish the two scenarios. Sadia, have I convinced or addressed your question? I think she's on this again. Uh, thank you, Sadia and Dr. Amonge. I'm going to ask you to please stop sharing your screen before you take the next question or comment. Okay. I think the next hand that was up was uh, Catherine. 
after Catherine, I'm going to take Jason and then Dr. Sanya, you can go next. So let's try and keep it brief because time is not on our side. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Doctor, for this um, presentation. I hope you can Thank hear you, me. Catherine. Yes, I can. Thank you, Catherine. Um, uh, I think you've answered my question, but let me just pose the question rather and see whether you can elaborate. But just as Dr. Sadia mentioned, that you mentioned the example of Indian minorities, or she mentioned also um, Muslim minorities also being analytical philosophers, recognizing African philosophers in that they have the same, come, they're coming from the same perspective. But what I personally don't understand is why wouldn't um, another minority be value laden instead of value free? Would it have to be the context in the sense of um, comparison? Another minority might analytically be an analytical philosopher recognized by a Western analytical philosopher as more um, in tune with the conversation um, compared to an, an African analytical philosopher. So does it depend on the context is, I think, what I'm trying to understand. Um, I, um, um, I, think, I, th I think part of your question um, uh, piggybacks on, on Sardias. Um, and, 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 and I think the same the same response um, should suffice in the sense that um, there are, of course, non-Western analytic philosophers who are very grounded in analytic philosophy. And one would expect that, that, that they express doubts and corrections and criticisms about one's positions. Um, but if, but if that doubt um, is 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 um, uh, is prior to any demonstration of credibility, then one is allowed to 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 interpret it in a in a in a, in a value leading manner, and in fact, a negative one, not a positive one. Um, um, but uh, um, so that is that is. Uh, that is that is what I would say in the sense that, um, again, say say I I enter a room of analytic philosophers, Western, non-Western, Indian, Chinese, Oriental. You know, there is a potpourri of different Western philosophers, and before I start giving my talk, I can see on their faces surprise. You know. Um, the 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 Western philosopher is surprised. The Indian philosopher is surprised. Um, in that case, one is one is one is one is uh, one is one is licensed, but most probably might be wrong, might not always be correct. But one is licensed to to interpret the two instances differently. The, 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 the Western analytic philosopher surprise as, as negatively evaluating and the Indian one as positively evaluating in the sense that the, uh, the West, just in the sense as I have discussed in the, in the talk. But then again, this, the, the, the distinction has to be, ha, has there been a demonstration of credibility before these attitudes were exhibited? If no, then it is prejudicial. Now we have to look at what the prejudice entails. And if yes, then it is not prejudicial and it is just the appropriate and expected philosophical practice. Catherine, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for the question. I think the next hand was Jason. And after Jason, I'm going to take Dr. Stanya. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm currently uh, vaguely in the dark. Thank you very much for the presentation. So I just want to, to you, note Jason. something that, that complicates us a little. I'm also um, an analytic philosopher and uh, a South African who's worked in the African tradition. And I've experienced everything you're saying. It sounds very familiar. Um, but I, I myself gave an account of 
methodologically defending analytic African philosophy once, and it was a deflationary account um, because analytic can mean different things. And the simplest version is a tradition called uh, plain language philosophy. And there's just a, a small problem here. I, I, I admire the, the route you've traced. There are pitfalls in terms of epistemic vices, but the idea behind what animates that that thin account of what analytic philosophy is, is that it's a tradition of explaining clearly and foregrounding your structure of clear explanation. So this is one of those things. If, you, if analytic philosophy is living up to what it's supposed to be, there ought to be something about it that means that it's methodologically a way of being clear and therefore ought to be praiseworthy. But at the same time, the as you say, this this mirrors, I think, or sorry, you didn't say this, but I think what you're saying is that this mirrors the, oh, you're so eloquent. So there are structural injustices that come with, oh, wow, you're so articulate and that are mirrored here. But it is something that can be obscured because if you, if you identify as analytic, you make it a point of pride that you try not to obfuscate, that you aim to lay out your premise structure in a standard form. Um, and there's a sense in which that is the thing being praised. So I suppose what I'm saying is I, well, it's particularly pernicious trying to find the versions of what is being admired that are out of, out of proportion to what's being done because analytic philosophy as a method is supposed to be about targeting clear expression. So uh, I, that's in no way uh, disputing what you're saying. I think your map of the, the vices on either side is accurate, but uh, I just want to note that um, methodologically, if you're doing analytic philosophy right, it's supposed to be something which is noteworthy for being clear and, and praiseworthy on those grounds, which just makes it trickier to, to navigate this. But thanks, I, I really appreciate your map. Thank you so much, Jason. And, and I think you're correct. Um, and I agree with you, uh, but then that 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 clarity of exposition also seems to 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 foreground why there is an analytic prejudice and philosophical practice, um, um, which then uh, also foregrounds the map that I have tried to trace out in this in this talk. So while it is praiseworthy to be an analytic philosopher or generally why analytic philosophy is praiseworthy, uh, that shouldn't uh, be a reason for taking it as the idea of philosophy. And, um, and to the extent to which that hegemony remains, there is going to be this epistemic justice, this, these forms of epistemic justice uh, I mean, philosophical practice, and so yeah, I agree with you. But then it's 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 a cash twenty two. So put, yeah. put another way, if it's if it's ordinary language philosophy, who's ordinary, uh, or what counts as plain language, um, and that's embedded in these in these questions of linguistic injustice. But uh, yes, no, I that you've answered my response. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Um... Dr. Sanya, your hand is up, and then I'll give, I'm going to give over to Dr. Oyoe to close the session for us. There are some Dr. questions Sanya. on the chat, though. Thank you you so might much. want to take a look at that, Sunny. OK. Sunny, thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mogi, for your very um, stimulating talk. Thank you so um, much. Thank you also for at least making a, um, a case for African philosophy initially. Um, but I'd like, just like to add um, um, that I think uh, we should also have to take into, into consideration the complexity of the traditions of African philosophy uh, in terms of you have the Anglophone, you have the Francophone, you have the Islamic tra um, philosophical tradition, which is quite, quite predominant in Northern Africa. And also you have the Lusophone um, tradition, which is um, it's a different kind of texture antenna um, so which from the analytic tradition. So when you were, when you, you, you started by implying that there are, and again, actually that there are quite a number of excesses within the analytic tradition and the forms of epistemic injustice 
contained or and um, contained in the in that tradition. So I was hoping that the next argument or the next step would be to um, carry out some sort of deconstruction and then uh, of the tradition with a view, either with a view to privileging some other traditions that are equally valid, you know, so that we have the uh, uh, a broader kind of uh, philosophical um, conversation amongst competing or no, not even not necessarily competing, but complementary traditions. That was what I was saying. So I think you, we, I, I don't know whether it's deliberate, but we reinscribe the hegemony which you had um, started by critiquing. So that's what I observed about your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Osha. I, I, will, I, will, I will take that into, into consideration while developing the paper and be more explicit about the the different nuances involved in the, in the demarcation of the African traditional philosophy. Thank you so much. I, I hadn't thought about that and I would, I would think more about it and add it to the eventual paper. Thank you, Dr. Sanya. Uh, so the question in the chat is from Roder and is asking uh, what recommendations would you make to dismiss this injustices? Oof, that's a tough one. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one because um, um, it's a tough one because it's, 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 it's a question that is not uh, particular to the epistemic injustices in philosophical practice, but general to epistemic injustice in general. You know, everyone keep uh, asking, now that there are a plethora of epistemic injustice, um, it's like philosophy has been bombarded recently with forms of epistemic injustice. Um, what can we do about it? And uh, it has been an OP task, um, uh, figuring out what's to be done about it, mainly because it operates as an implicit bias and implicit bias are a tough nut to crack, really. So uh, I think the best anyone can do is to, is, to, is to make us aware that there are these forms of epistemic injustices, um, but as to what's to be done about it, um, I really do not know. <laughs> But how would you answer that question? How can we, how can we dismantle these injustices in philosophy? Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm not feeling very well, so you probably will get it from the sound of my voice. Uh, thanks, Michael, for that presentation. Uh, apologies for joining very late. Can you hear me? Yes, Tony. Thank you so much for yeah. Uh, apologies for joining late. Um, I, I, I can't uh, answer that question. Uh, I, I, if Mike couldn't answer it, there was just no way I can, I can answer it. But, but I, I wanted to just make a point quickly, uh, uh, Michael. So um, it, it wasn't clear to me why the injustice, uh, at least on the one side, is due to the the ability of the African philosopher to, to uh, uh, exhibit the qualities associated with an analytic philosopher. I can see very clearly the injustice uh, as it relates to Africanity, but the analyticity, <laughs> which is a, a tough word, I, I couldn't, it's not clear to me, it seems to me that even um, Africans who identify as continental philosophers uh, or Africans who identify with neither of those uh, uh, traditions um, or a mishmash of both would, would face similar kinds of, uh, would agree with much of what you're saying. So, so I wasn't quite sure what the link is between the injustice and, and the and analytic philosophy per se. And, and if there is any link, whether that is, is as strong as your, your talk um, suggests. Um, um, in, the, in the abstract submitted for this talk, I did claim that 
um, geophilosophical ignorance and the concomitant epistemic injustice that it elicits are widespread. Um, but I have shied away from that in this talk. And, and that is uh, intentional in the sense that uh, while I have a feeling that um, other marginalized traditions would face the same um, form of epistemic injustice, um, I don't think I'm equipped to, to or I'm, I don't think I stand appropriately in the epistemic space to make that claim. Uh, in the sense that, uh, as I've prefaced this talk, it is based purely or solely on my own experience. And so I, I can talk to other people who are either continental philosophers and African philosophers or African philosophers or uh, Indian philosophers and analytic philosophers, or as you have put it, a mismatch of, uh, um, of, of different tradition, marginalized and not marginalized. Um, but I think I agree with you that um, all the marginalized philosophers would face the same uh, epistemic injustice, um, um, but it is not one I am equipped to make and, and not one I am making. And as to the injustices from analytic philosophy, I think what underscores that is the analytic prejudice I discussed. Um, I don't think continental philosophy uh, is taking to, 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 to be an hegemonic power like analytic philosophy is. Yes, they are both kinds of Western philosophy, um, but I think there is, there, is, there is that bias that analytic philosophy is, 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 uh, is more superior even than continental philosophy. Um, a, a, a quick, a quick um, scroll through Twitter, for example, would, would, uh, would, would demonstrate that continental philosophers and analytic philosophers, even though they are both Westerners, uh, in a constant um, um, epistemic war. Um, um, continentals are fighting analytics, analytics are fighting continentals. And often to the claim that analytic philosophy is not better off in any sense. Um, and, that, and that hegemony is, is, is what I'm leveraging on, which, which, which seems to uh, highlight the, the, the superiority of analytic philosophy and hence the epistemic injustice that that flows and stems from there. No, I, I hear you, Mike. I, I was just saying whether the, of course, the, the there's the link between the injustices you mentioned and analytic philosophy. But I was just wondering whether um, it, it's, it's as strong as you make it. Uh, if, if someone shows up in a room uh, of, full of Western philosophers and 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 he and he he presents a paper and he does so well and I'm sure people will exhibit the same kinds of reaction uh, probably at the fact that oh there's this this African person from somewhere we don't know uh, uh, doing so well in philosophy and 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 that'll be enough to get uh, 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 the talk about injustice is going uh, without focusing specifically on analytic philosophy, I'm not denying the claim that you're making. I'm just saying it, it looks like, uh, and of course you don't need to know about other marginalized uh, traditions. It's just a point about what, what, what's, what's really, anyway, this is my own experience. What's really happening there is that uh, people perceive someone who uh, they think that uh, probably lacks the ability to philosophize at a high level, um, uh, doing so in a way that surprises them. And it's not so much the analysis, it, it, it could be it could be continental, it could be any kind of philosophy, but it's it's a philosophy it's, it's the power to philosophize, I think, that is that is an issue rather than which uh, tradition in philosophy that, that was the point I was uh, I was making. But I mean it, <laughs> we can leave it there. Yeah I, again I agree with you but 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 once, but once that, but once that surprise is 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 laced by by the identity of the said presenter, then there is a form of identity prejudice. And yes, yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So no, no, I, I I agree with all that. I was just yeah, but we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can, we can, we can argue about this privately, Tony. <laughs> sure. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oyowe. Okay, we are, time is not on our side. I know we started like six minutes late. So if people could just like allow me, give me like an extra three minutes because I see one hand, but also there's a question in the chat. I think that was the first question we had. Dr. Mong, I'm going to read the question to you and just briefly. And so the question is, from Hosea and he's asking that, how can we correct this going forward? Uh, number two, on credibility access and deficit, will the Western doubt be not seen as positive rather than the Africa praise, right? And then I'm gonna take the question from John. John, you can unmute yourself, please keep it brief. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the presentation. Thank you, John. Um, I uh, appreciate it. Um, there's a lot that you say that resonates, of course, with the discourse around white ignorance and um, the black-white dynamic. Interesting to, it would be interesting to hear how you'd relate this uh, analytic versus African to, to that, whether we're going Charles Mills or we're going Franz Fanon. But what I wondered was, there are obviously professional reasons for someone like you, which I respect, to care about analytic philosophy's attitude towards or treatment of African philosophers or African analytic philosophers. Do you think there are any philosophical reasons why African philosophy or philosophers should care? Like professional reasons, yes, but should African philosophy not just look at that and say that's wrong, misguided, racist, a whole range of things and say, we're building our own thing here, which is more important than what you guys are doing, something like that. Uh, philosophically speaking, because professionally, of course. Well, philosophically speaking, um, not to not to resurrect the the the, the old um, debate about um, um, the old existence debate of whether there is African philosophy, but philosophically speaking, I think that African philosopher, uh, philosophers should care about these uh, prejudicial attitudes from Western analytic uh, philosophers because um, it, it, uh, it, it yeah, again, some, okay, let me put it this way. Um, epistemic injustice as, as, as a research field um, is now gaining much traction even within the African continent. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think UJ has, has a whole research institute of epistemic injustice, on epistemic injustice, I should say. Um, so there is, there is, there is this, there is this wide, widespread awareness of, 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 of making forms of epistemic injustice known to, to philosophers and non-philosophers, in fact. Um, and though I did not discuss how my talk today contributes uniquely to that literature, but it does. So for so I'm going to limit the philosophical relevance of these prejudicial attitudes to African philosophers who are interested in epistemic injustice. That those that these attitudes that I've discussed in this talk they contribute uniquely to the um, epistemic injustice literature. Um, and that could be some philosophical significance or, or relevance. I give you a very quick example. Epistemic meekness, for example, is, as far as I'm aware, the only form of self-directed epistemic injustice. Um, as far as I'm aware, again, um, the literature only discusses other directed, other directed epistemic injustice. You know, there is someone who has been epistemically unjust to an epistemic agent. But epistemic meekness, as I have characterized it, is an epistemic injustice done on Africans by Africans. And that is a unique contribution to the literature, which an African philosopher who is interested in epistemic injustice should want to take cognizance of. So uh, I haven't thought about your question. I'm just quickly um, picking 
picking rabbits out of my hat, but I think that is one philosophical relevance um, that I would uh, yeah, say. John, does that, does that work? Oh, sorry, I thought there wasn't time to say anything. No, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate your diagnosis, which I agree with, I'm not challenging. The question came from something I've heard Lewis Gordon say, kind of building on, on bell hooks, you know, the, the master's tools won't uh, dismantle them. And him saying, sure, but the master, but what people have been doing, especially African and black people since enslaved times is using the master's tools to build their own things. And the real aim is to build something that makes those silly Western people irrelevant. Uh, it was from that kind of point of view, but I appreciate I the, the response as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. I will, I will chat more about this with you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for, for our last question. Thank you to everyone for the great discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Omonge. Again, we really appreciate you for waking up in the morning for this great talk. Uh, please do visit our HIMBA website to find out more about our events coming in the next week and in the future. Once again, uh, from the HIMBA family, thank you so much for attending and thank you for the great conversation. Thank you Bye. so much for having me. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you.